going on people we are tottenham tv back here for another tottenham update for you guys again it's that time of the month for the premier league awards to come through once again we got the nominations we'll speak about in a minute but before we do that go and check out our website for the latest tottenham articles the link is in the description below and also on your screen right now wattv.co.uk let's go there to check out our latest articles but let's get into the tottenham update and let's start off with the manager of the month nominations. Bezaj Postacoglu is going for the hat trick. He won the first two manager of the month awards of the season. Is he going to win the third? Uh, the only person in the awards in the running that does have a 100% record. Three wins out of three. Mikel Arteta is up for it. Two wins, one draw. Unai Emre, the same record. And Jurgen Klopp, the same record as well. Uh, but, you know, having said that, Mikel Arteta does have a win against Man City um, in his uh, repertoire this month. But you can't look away from Ange Postecoglou, 100% record this month. Yeah, I guess the only thing you can take into account is maybe the difficulty of games because Arsenal drew away at Chelsea. They got a win at home to Man City and obviously beat Sheffield United 5-0. So they would say, well, we've had harder games and still be getting results. But Spurs are the only team with a 100% record. Who have we been? Luton, Palace and Fulham. Pretty comfort uh, comfortably the, as well. The only goal we conceded this month should have been ruled out because it should have been a handball. Mm. So we should have been going a whole month without conceding a goal. That should have been the case. Yeah. And we've been deserving, I think, of all the wins that, that we've picked up. Also winning with 10 men. Um, well, which is not easy to do, especially when we went down to 10 men when the game was still a nil-nil. So we had that, we have that. And he's the only manager with a 100% record. But are they really going to give it to him three months in a row? That's the question. That's, if he hadn't won it last, let's say he didn't win it last month, then I don't think it's even a question this month. The only thing that maybe thinks he might not is because they've already given it to him twice. I believe the only manager that has won three in a row is Pep Guardiola. So that I shows mean, the levels he does, we're at. He's, he's in big company. Who else? And, well, Louis saying Mourinho as well, just ready for the Chelsea previews behind the screen. He's saying Jose Mourinho as well has won it three so times. Someone's going to have to do a fact check. The, yeah, the we're gonna, well. exactly. You you guys do a fact check on that one. Uh, <laughs> but look, for his th first three months in management, he's making the Premier League look a bit piss easy at the moment. He's making waves. Look, it's, it's easy does it, apparently. And especially with the football he's played, we can only see an identity in this team compared to like a lot of other teams who have managers who have been there longer and they, you struggle to see how what they're trying to do. With Postacoglu, it seems very simple and it seems very effective as well. What a job he's done. Yeah, crazy. But I'm backing him to get that third one in a row and maybe the fourth one in a row uh, next month as he's well. Gonna he's going to win every. He's going to do a clean <laughs> he's sweep the whole season. Single one. Uh, but look, that's the manager of the month uh, nominations let's look at the player of the month nominations now you've got douglas louise two goals one assist brian and buemo two goals two assists pedro neto with three assists declan rice with one goal one assist mohammed salah with five assists uh with, sorry with five goals and kuti romero uh, no goal contributions but he is a center back and he's been unbelievable this month and as i say we should have had three <laughs> clean sheets this yeah. month and he would have been a massive part of that it's a massive shame i reckon uh if that guy who doesn't um get scored he probably has even bigger shout uh to get um player of the month because three clean sheets and he's been probably our best defender arguably in all, all of those games i think he he definitely deserves recognition i'm really happy it's very rare that um player of the month nominations recognize defensive ability so i'm happy he's getting the recognition he deserves but i think yeah salah will probably take it this month unfortunately yeah, I agree. salah has been unbelievable this month to be honest five goals um in his three games so i don't think you can look away from him but don't take away from what kuti romero has done this month because he's been brilliant Let's talk about some more awards as well, because the African Player of the Year nominations are in as well. And Eve Basuma and Pape Matasar have both been nominated for the award, and the award will be announced in Marrakesh on the 11th of December. Uh, some other players, there's a 30-man shortlist, by the way, for this award, so um, it's not the smallest one. But other notable names are Sadio Mane, Victor Osimhen, Yusuf El Nesri, Yassin, Bounou, Safian Amrabat, Hakim Ziyech. Azadine Unahi, Ashraf Hakimi, uh, Sergio Gurassi, Thomas Partey, Mohamed Kudus, Mohamed Salah, uh, Sekou Fofana, Chancel and <coughs> uh, Vincent Abu Bakar, um, Edmund Tapsoba, Riyad Mahrez, and to name uh, just a few of them. But mm. do you think Saar and Basuma have a chance of winning this one? No, <laughs> <laughs> I do not. Uh, no, I mean, look, to be fair, it seems like they've been... I'm not sure why Basuma's up for it, because he had a terrible season last year. Yeah, but you said Saar barely played last year as yeah, well. Yeah, true. So, I mean, they've both had great starts to the season. I don't even know if that's taken into account in this award. I'm assuming it does. It's for 2023, is it? So it must take into account um, how they've played at the beginning of the season. But 
it's literally been a few like in the grand um scheme of the year it's only been a lot 10 games so mm-hmm. i don't think that you can really argue that they're up for the award but if Pasuma had been playing like he is now for the whole year then i think there's definitely a case mm-hmm. and sar as well but unfortunately it's just too small a sample size yeah um, let's move on and let's talk about potential January transfer plans. As Charlie Eccleshare says that reinforcements in centre-back and the forward areas, a central striker or a left-sided winger are likely to be targeted in January. Spurs also need a replacement for Hoybier or Giovanni Lo Celso if they are to leave. Do you think that's the right plans to have this window? 100%. 100% centre-back has to be a priority. We know that we're very short in that position. If we were to pick up an injury, that would be the position that everyone's most worried about because... The I think if you're talking about the gap between the first team and the and the uh, and the subs. I don't think it's as big anywhere apart from that position. Um, it would really be catastrophic if one of those was to get a long term injury. So I think centre back has to be priority. And then I think it would be probably someone in the forward line because at the moment the wingers are doing well, but they're not maybe doing as well as they could be and maybe they're not as perfect fit for what Postacoglu wants from his wingers as as they could be as well especially on the left so I do think a left winger slash someone who could maybe come in cover up front uh, I guess it's very similar to Brennan who's maybe more natural on the right and can cover the forward the forward position as well maybe someone similar on the left would be um would be probably a, a really good position to get. And, and again, centre, the central midfield, I don't see it as a priority. I think we're pretty well stocked there. Mm. But if Hoybe or the Celso were to leave, I would like to see Tom bring in. So I think that's pretty, per- that's like, if I was to choose like the perfect January, that's probably what I'd go for. Yeah, I, I do agree. But in terms of if we are to look for a left winger to come in, who do you reckon like the biggest loser in the squad is? Because Richarlison. Do, you think Richarlison? Do you think if we bring in a left winger, that pretty much confirms in your mind that we're probably going to look to move him on in the summer? I would say so. I would say so because he's not done at the job he's played and when he's played up front has been shocking. Hasn't showed anywhere near enough quality when he's played up front. He's been better in the left wing, don't get me wrong, and I'm happy for him that he's playing a bit better on the left. But if we do bring in a left winger, he's the one who's going to miss out. That's going to limit his game time even more. It's going to be even more difficult for him to break into the team. And when he does get his chance, he just isn't showing enough to keep his place. And Yes, he's shown improvement. He is contributing, and I'm happy about that. But that doesn't mean he's showing enough to that if someone else was to come in, like like he's he's nailed down that spot. He's not. He's done far from nailing down that spot. So mm. he'd definitely be the biggest loser. Yeah. Um, what, what about Brian Hill and and his future at the club? Do you think that's a bit up in it's the been, air? It's been it's a bit harsh, but he's already like he wouldn't lose more than he's got at the moment like he's yeah, got nothing know, we, at the moment we did, we did hear that Ange Postacoglu you know rejected a loan move for him didn't want him to go out alone because he sees value in him and he sees maybe a future for him at the club I, and that's fine but at the moment he's not getting any minutes and that's not going to change if we bring someone Only else because of injury left. though isn't it He's only been fit for a game or two. I want to see him get time. Again, uh, actions speak louder than words. I want to see Hill get the opportunities. And if he does them and he takes them, and then we sign a left winger, even though Hill's playing well, then that's something to be said. But right now, Hill's not playing. And we've got, uh, like, I don't think, unless he's starting to get minutes and then that, that gets limited because of new signing, then that's something. But I haven't seen him start to get minutes yet, so... Let's uh, talk about a potential striker that Spurs are targeting in this January transfer window. Sport Witness says that Tottenham are among the clubs keeping an eye on Santos striker Marcus Leonardo. A number of clubs are interested in him. The likes of Arsenal, Newcastle, Chelsea and Manchester United have all been monitoring the player. He's a player that's um, scored quite a few goals, actually. I think he's got a goal rate of one in every two games for Santos in all competitions this season. And last season as well, um, scored over 20 goals in all competitions. So he's definitely someone that knows mm. where the back of the net is. 20 years of age. Uh, would you be interested in looking at him? Why not? To, to a young striker from Brazil who has got a good goal scoring record. Seems to be, I mean, look, I've never seen him play, but why not? I mean, we obviously we've got Valise uh, now who's had a, I wouldn't say similar, but compare obviously last season, what did he get? Like he got 10 goals or something, nine goals in uh, the Argentinian league as a very, very young striker. So clearly we're looking at that market and, and we're, we're taking um, stock on players who are playing well. So I guess take a look hundred percent. What if you're, if you're convinced this guy could be the next big thing then it's worth taking a punt, but I wonder how much he's going to cost because he seems to be building a name for himself after two years of banging a lot of goals at a young age. Yeah, uh, let's move on and talk about uh, Gabonini. Leonardo Gabonini has been speaking to The Athletic and um, there are quite a few interesting quotes to go through. So let's take it quote by quote. I've only 
taken a couple here and he's talked about Van der Ven and he says, when we have a player like Van der Ven, it's not so simple as he's tall and fast. We'll have to predict the future. You need to be sure. Um, you need to be sure what the decision makers start to say. I don't know. The price is high. He's young. He's not a national team. Your job is to be there and say, no, go ahead. He will achieve great things. And this is the thing I'm most proud of at Tottenham because I didn't fight for the obvious players. And then he did go on to say that he feels like Van der Ven is like the Haaland of uh, central defenders, didn't he? Yeah, exactly. He said he's like Haaland at centre-back with uh, his strength and his, uh, his pace and uh, his, uh, how ruthless he is. And look, he's he obviously did some great scouting picking out Van der Ven. A lot of people were looking at maybe think of other uh, centre-backs uh, to go for. And albeit he's young and he did have one season in the Bundesliga and he was one that... Uh, we were very excited about with the prospect of him when we were linked with him. He still wasn't a massive name. A lot of people didn't know who he was when he first got linked with us. So clearly they've done a brilliant job in the scouting department. And now everyone's raving about him. I think Wenger was saying he looks incredible and this guy is going to be a top centre-back and a lot of P uh, pundits are now starting to take notice of how impressive he's been. And it needs people like Gabonini to fight for that, for those things because clearly he's eluding that. I think there were people maybe uh, who were, he said, key decision-makers were maybe not so in favour of it with the money that that would needed to be spent to sign him because he's young, doesn't have international experience. I think he's alluding to the fact that there are a lot of doubts about it, but he really pushed for it. So that's a really good thing. It's not like that. You heard like reports coming out of Liverpool saying, oh, we want to sign Van der Ven, but we don't feel like he's completely ready for the Premier League yet. We were saying when Van der Ven was coming in, you know, we're going to need to be patient with this guy because mm -hmm. we don't know if he's going to, you know, hit the take to the Premier League so quickly. He's going to need a bedding in period. But none of that seems to have been true, has it? Absolutely not. He maybe took half a game, <laughs> like, literally, if that. So he's been phenomenal, I have to say. Haven't had to be patient at all. And another quote from uh, Gabonini says, uh, when a new sporting director arrives, usually they say, I need time to change because the process is really long. It's bullshit. It doesn't have to be long. If you are strong and you have a clear idea, you can change everything in one month. The experience at Tottenham helped me a lot. And I'm a fan now. I'm watching every game, celebrating every goal. I need to say thank you to them. We did a difficult job. And now there is a clear pathway. Young players, the right manager. I am proud. I don't need a medal. This is our job. And I'll be happy if it all goes well. I know the job that we did. Um, when you want to be a sporting director like, like I do, maybe you need to take another path, start with another club. And maybe one day I can come back to a club like Tottenham as a sporting director. Wow. He seems to have really enjoyed his time at Spurs. And clearly, look, they've put a structure in place, haven't they? You've seen that the, the youth players are doing very well now. They're starting to get a few more opportunities. Obviously, Ange is a manager who's willing to give young players opportunities. And that really puts the good work he does in place when you have a manager like Ange who's willing to really trust these young players. It means that when you're doing all this scouting work and you're finding players, you don't have someone like Conte who uh, who's basically putting stumbling blocks in front of these players and not giving them the opportunities to allow them to flourish. You've got a manager like Ange who's like Van der Ven, going to put him in straight away. Conte probably in that situation would have tried to bed Van der Ven in and would have probably started to die for the first few weeks until he feels Van der Ven is ready. But Ange, you know, threw caution to win and said, look, I believe, I believe in his quality. I, I don't care about his age. I'm going to put him in. Same with Udogi. But I'm sure Conte probably would have started Davis. Like, same with Saar. Um, other managers as well. So I only wanted to use Sarah as like a literally a last port of call. Everything. And even when he played and played well, he still yeah. didn't trust him after yeah. that. And that was the most frustrating thing. Uh, again, Brian Hill, last port of call he was. And even when, again, when he started and played well, he still didn't carry, continue to trust him. So we now have a manager who's going to allow people like Gabonini and hopefully McKenzie's work to go to good use. And he's actually going to use these players and give them opportunities to flourish. Now that And now, now that structure is in place, which Paratici and Gabonini have helped implement. And you know, the greatest thing about it was like when Conte, Mourinho, uh, Nuno were here, there was just no like synergy between anyone at this football club. And you're looking at now, you're looking at it now, you're under 18s, the under 21s, the first team, all kind of have this synergy together. We're all like playing the same style of football. So it will make it seamless for players to like come up the ranks. And that creates that pathway from the youth to the first team. And um, you're seeing it now, the under 18s, I think, I don't think they're top of the league anymore. I think they're second. The, un the under 21s are top of the league. The first team are top of the league and it's all based on the same way of same style of football that Ange Postecoglou has implemented throughout the whole of the football club not just the first team so it's great to see 100% and also the youth players must be looking at the first team thinking Udogi starting uh, Sar is starting Van der Ven is starting every week I'm not that I'm not that far behind them in terms of age so there's 
you know, if I improve, if I prove myself, I'm going to get opportunities. And it's also like if you're a Jamie Donnelly, if you're one of these players in these under 21 team, and you're kind of envisage the future and see what where you can fit in in this football team, it becomes a lot more clear because when they're playing the same style of football, you know exactly where you're going to fit in in that team. Whereas opposed to before and the style of football was completely different to the different age ranges you're looking at it and be like do i actually fit into this team mm. you know what i mean mm -hmm. so it makes even the younger players like see that vision 100 percent. but that is your tottenham update for today let me know in the comment section below your thoughts regarding everything that we spoke about today do click that link in the description below to see all of our latest articles like subscribe and comment and as always come on you spurs, spurs.